So the Legion Slim 7 series have historically been very easy for me to recommend to anyone. They're the classic all-rounder. But my recent review of the Legion Pro 7i, the non-slim version, gave me plenty to be concerned about. In their generation 8, they scaled back on the RGB, the build quality was less premium, they got rid of the biometric login, they got rid of the rear panel lights, they got rid of the force sensitive WSD keys. So, did Legion give its slim 7 Gen 8 the same treatment this time around? Well, let's find out. Starting off with the hardware specifications first, and I did seek out intentionally a more humble loadout. This comes with the 13th generation i7 processor, so the 13700H, so 14 core CPU, and that was paired with the RTX 4060, which has 8 gigs of VRAM running at 128 bits, alongside 16 gigabytes of DDR5 RAM and 512 gigs of storage. So this specification costed me 1850 Canadian dollars and that included taxes, discounts, the one year premium, the accidental protection. Despite the criminally small storage at 512 gigs, I personally think that that's pretty decent value for money. Overall, good news for Nvidia and Intel fans because last time around, you could only get this in the Advantage Edition with the AMD, Ryzen and Radeon combination. You can still spec this with a Ryzen processor, but no Radeon. AMD 7000 series mobile GPUs are still very rare to find. You can also get the i9 processor in this, which can boost up to 5.4 GHz instead of just 5 GHz in this. And in terms of GPU, you can only spec it as high as a 4070. Now, the interesting thing about that is it also comes with 8 gigs of VRAM and it also comes with 128 bits of memory bus. And the power limits are also going to be roughly the same, around 100 watts. You'll find out more about it later in the video. But the 4070 would have twice the amount of CUDA cores. And I think that loadout with the i9 and the 4070 would be around 400 Canadian dollars more. But I have this configuration here because it makes having a thin and light gaming laptop in a premium look and feel a little bit more affordable. And well, primarily, I wanted to test if the 4060 is going to roughly perform similarly to the 4070, especially considering there aren't a lot of technical differences on paper. So stick around to find out if I was wrong or skip to the respective chapter. But before I go any further, just a quick request. If you find the content in my video to be useful, please do consider liking and subscribing. It gives me a lot of encouragement to keep on going. Now, taking an outside in approach to the Slim 7 series, well, it's in the name. We have to talk about the thickness of this device. And when you hold it first, like it genuinely feels like a relatively light and thin laptop. Legion in its technical specification claim that this has a thickness that ranges from 0.69 inches to 0.78 inches and the reason for that is that it's thinner at the front and a little thicker at the back but here's the thing this isn't as thin as my razor blade that you can see right here it is 0.67 inches through and through front to back if i even compare this to my alienware x16 that has a thickness of 0.73 inches it's the thickest at 0.73 inches this is still thicker in comparison to a device which has a 4080, a fully powered mobile 4080 that can go up to 170 watts. This then is slim to Legion's own standard, to its own sort of uh, offering. But I don't know, considering the competition, I feel Legion could have done better in terms of thickness. I am really glad that they kept like the premium build on this, so they still have that brushed aluminium band running all around it. Like in terms of that, it has more in common with the 7th generation Legion 7, like the non-slim version, than the newer one. It still has that standard gray color it's uh, lighter than the generation 8 non-slim nothing wrong with the color at all it makes it look pretty understated and like a standard business laptop but actually this would look epic in white i mean legion just do it already if you put this next to its predecessor uh, you won't find actually a lot different at all maybe a little different in terms of its shade of gray but the one thing that does stand out is actually on its sides the vents in particular instead of like three slots on each side you'll see four on this one also when you flip it over you will see even more ventilation at the bottom these personally for me are very welcome changes because they favor better thermal on the back now you get 
3 Type A ports instead of the 2 in the last generation. And you still get the 2 Type C ports on the side as well. Uh, and one of them, as you can see here already, can take up a charging adapter up to 140 watts. Now, some of you might think like one extra Type A port does not make a big difference. But if I want to plug in my mouse, my headphone, and my Xbox adapter all together, that additional Type A port sort of works for me. Because otherwise, I'll have to carry, a, carry around like a silly uh, USB hub. You still get that full size. SD jack on the right and this time around actually they have switched their headphone jack from the right to the left now and this is good news for me as a right-handed user because then my mouse and the headphone jack doesn't get tangled together also have to mention like the physical kill switch for the camera on the side as well so this is good news for criminals who have objectionable digital interests. These port lights on the back, well, as you can see, are lit, which is not the case for the non-slim version. It means you don't have to turn the device around all the time for you to plug your peripherals in. On the lid, the Legion logo is like a near mirror finish. It has no RGB on it. And uh, if I haven't been demonstrating already, you can open this device with uh, one finger like you'll see there's a little bit of wobble otherwise it is a very stiff hint. like it feels very very sturdy zero wobble when you're typing even like a lunatic on this you still get perforation next to the power button key which yes does double as biometric login so i'm glad that they still have it i sometimes even prefer it to facial login other than that like the keyboard deck has like the same look you can see legion is still pretty vested in their keypad on the side some of you might really like it but for me i haven't found many use cases for it so far i'm more down for function over aesthetics but if we get rid of the keypad this keyboard comes in the middle and this trackpad also comes in the middle and i think that would vastly improve the way this looks and it might even start appealing to some users i don't know i'm just thinking out loud there is 1.5 millimeters of key travel on this and they feel very very similar to all of the previous devices that we've had. The quick brown fox jumps over the... I wish there was more clickiness to it, but typing accuracy on this is legendary. I wrote the script for this video using this keyboard right here as well. And my experience was flawless. Just a minor thing I want to mention. These edges, although tapered, uh, can feel a little bit sharp. So when your wrists are resting here, uh, after a while, it might start to feel a little bit uncomfortable, but, but not a big deal to be honest. You also get that perky RGB on this deck, and this is the only RGB you get on this device, but you can customize it using Vantage Zone software. So you've got lots of effects to choose from. And I really like that you can just cycle between your profiles using the function spacebar shortcut key. This is full white for me, some RGB be here there's that visor effect if you want it you've got your rainbow swirl plenty to go around for rgb enthusiasts something that i really appreciate across all legions is the way they've built shortcuts into their keyboard you can also quickly switch between your refresh rates to save power you want to go down to 60 hertz you just go function hour and it quickly switches to 60 hertz and then you want to go back up to 240 hertz you can also switch on and off your back port lightings right here function u and this turns on and off you can also quickly switch between your performance profile your power profiles and right now you'll see here it's on the balance profile because the ring over here is white like this is also a very neat indicator something that i desperately miss on my x16 so you go function q it goes into its silent mode right now i'm connected uh, using that type c power it's not getting the full 230 watts so it won't go to power mode but you'll see a red ring like there once you switch there and of course you get the full bank of media keys up top you get your play pause forward back buttons on the right as well you get a mute key in the middle i wish they had an indicator to show if your mic is mute or not also the trackpad nice and large glass using precision drivers my only slight complaint with it is when you click it it feels like it has more of a travel distance than is needed i'm usually like a clicker i need like that tactile feel for it but this device forced me to become like a tapper because the clickiness felt like too much of an effort since i use a mouse most of the time this doesn't bother me as much the one concern that you might have is because of the offset towards the left you have left room for your wrist i've been using my alienware x16 as like my daily 
friendly driver nowadays and it's got its trackpad in the middle switching from that to this was no problem at all this still felt as comfortable so not a deal breaker not for me at least webcam it's a 1080p sensor i think it's probably the same hardware that they've been using ever since they switched from 720p to 1080p nothing wrong with it but it's starting to look a little bit dated now i do appreciate the wide field of view that we get here so it should be pretty good for meetings the special thing about this though is you get toby horizon with this webcam so something that can track your head movement and it's got a few productivity advantages and some gaming advantages as well for example it can monitor how long you've been sitting in front of your screen it will automatically detect you not being there so it will lock your device it can also blur your screen if you look away for a little bit it can also identify your face continuously so it's only you with your face that can continue to use this device otherwise it will just lock out very useful for criminals out there or top secret agents in terms of games though there aren't a lot of titles that are compatible with this hardware i think they're listed around 65 games as the time of this recording generally i'm very happy with the conventional means of using my mouse to look around my environment in these games and not look like a crazy person just doing this in front of my screen a little bit gimmicky for me so far maybe in formula 1 2023 might feel a little bit more useful now the display here this too feels pretty similar i'd say this is the exact same qhd plus display that we got on the non-slim legion 7 gen 8 that screen felt a lot like the qhd plus display on the previous gen 7 only difference these displays go up to 240 hertz and the previous ones went to 165 hertz but in terms of color accuracy all of that remained pretty much the same all that aside these screens are still one of the brightest at 500 nits at least in the ips panel category it supports hdr 400 it's got 5 milliseconds of response time 100 srgb coverage but 70 percent on the dci p3 which is kind of disappointing considering legion has been positioning this for creators but despair not this time around you get another option you can spec this up with their 2k display so that is 3000 by 2000 resolution that does cover 100 dci p3 but it has a lower brightness of about uh, 430 nits still pretty comparable and a lower 165 hertz refresh rate but i would say if your primary use case for this device is gaming just stick to the 1600p display you get the higher refresh rate also means that your 4060 or 4070 on this device is not going to struggle a lot to run at native resolution like 3000 by 2000 can be a bit much for those gpus so just be careful about that but all of that put aside i think a lot of manufacturers have gone to many led options now and legion this year did not introduce anything of the sort legion come on you should have given us a mini led option this year not the next year in terms of sound honestly i think it's pretty bare bones just the two uh, speakers on the left and the right firing downwards two watts each they just get the job done like their bass is sort of underrepresented volume is so so it's average at best with that let's move to internal starting off with thermals this does not get a vapor chamber instead it gets about three to four heat pipes that are shared between the cpu and gpu i mean if you want to have a direct look at it it's a pretty straightforward process you need a phillips head screwdriver and eight screws later you should be able to get into it make sure you get some good prying tools so that you can have something that fits through the slits or maybe like a suction cup to lift the bottom panel out otherwise it can be really easy to bend like the aluminium all around it so you won't like that once i got inside i was glad to see that you have two m.2 slots for your storage so both of them can be double-sided i did screw in a two terabyte drive in here now in my alienware x16 i got like a separate heat spreader with a thermal pad underneath for individual drives and this one when you open it up you won't see it because there is a thermal pad that is attached directly to the bottom lid the aluminium bottom panel on its own acts as the full heat spreader so it's not technically required but the drive that i got actually came with its own heat spreader despite that being pasted on there was still room for the device to seal back up again now three to four heat pipes may not sound like much i mean if you compare it to its rival the m16 from asus like they've got like i don't know like six seven eight heat pipes now and they even gave a third fan for better heat dissipation and legion is still you know doubling down on their conventional design they call it the cold front 5.0 whatever i feel they could have innovated a little bit more when i hear from experts it's not just the number of heat pipes, but it's also the way they're configured. It's also their width, just a lot of other technical specifications. The way Legion describes it, two 60 millimeter fans, larger hybrid copper heat pipes, 
I don't know what that means, but they are using a phase change thermal compound, so something like liquid metal. So I'm glad they have it this time around. And like I mentioned earlier, more room for air to flow because of those larger vents. In the literature, they also mentioned a turbocharged 12 volts dual liquid polymer fan system. There is your fancy word. I have used this device for long gaming sessions like Modern Warfare 2 for like three hours. I've used it for document editing, like all of the like primary use cases you can put it through, like video editing, all of that. I recognize that these areas, like for me, like these wrist areas, and of course the keyboard deck, never felt uncomfortable while using this even under heavy load. The fan sort of adjusts. Just a little bit of a visual on thermal performance, you should be seeing like a chart up on screen right now to show the difference between the CPU and GPU temps. Like these temps were captured while playing a Modern Warfare 2 online match. You'll see the GPU temps sort of oscillate between like maybe 72 degrees and like 80 degrees. But on average, 78 degrees Celsius for the GPUs. Uh, and the CPU was mostly between 75 degrees and 80 degrees as well. Now, if I compare this with the M16 thermals, the one that I reviewed earlier, I found a log while playing Hogwarts actually. And there I saw that the GPU temps were roughly averaging 73 degrees. And that's, well, substantially less. Maybe down the line, this could need a thermal repasting sooner than you need it on the M16. We don't know. It's sort of set signs. Even if we compare the same sort of uh, Call of Duty match on my X16, the Alienware X16, which has four fans. There, the GPU temperatures average 83 degrees, but that's running a 4080 that goes up to 170 watts. So again, it's not all that straightforward. So let's also talk about the battery. 99 watt hours worth of it. The predecessor, the Gen 7 of the Slim 7, actually had 71 watt hours of battery. I know in some regions you were still getting 99 watt hours, but here in Canada and the US, I think that's the best that we got. So that's definitely a huge improvement. So I did the standard test. Constant screen on, a YouTube video playing at 1080p, obviously top gear. A constant network stream, that means. A few Chrome tabs open some documents open. I set the GPU to iGPU mode only, then also dropped the refresh rate from 240 to 60 hertz. I even turned off the lighting on the rear ports, dropped the RGB brightness on the keyboard to about a tenth of the full brightness. So the results, I got three hours and 21 minutes, which isn't so terrible. I would say that in the M16, my battery test sort of gave me close to four hours which is again a little bit more like or actually noticeably more than what i'm getting here and i think that was because i could turn off a lot of the cores specifically within their own armory crate software that may have helped but the thing is that was still running a 4070 with an i9 processor and it still gave more battery life so definitely there's room for improvements in this department the battery life not as good as i'd originally hope. Maybe the Ryzen version with this gives better battery life. If you're one out there who's using the Ryzen version, please drop in a comment and let us know what your battery life has been like. To charge up this battery, it comes with a 230 watt brick. It's not the Gallium Night Brick one, I believe, because if I put it next to the Alienware X16 power adapter, which is 330 watts, 100 watts more. That one looks slightly bigger than this one. This is the same adapter that Legion has been using in their past, like two, three generations now. Time to give it an uplift. While we are on the subject of internals, we have to talk about RAM. And you only get one SODIMM slot on the board. One is already soldered on. Particularly for this one with the 16 gigs, it's got 8 gigs soldered and 8 gigs a state that you can remove and replace with a 16 gigs one, right? That means you'll have to forego your dual channel configuration. So like the memory speeds can actually kind of go down. If you've got both use cases, for example, for editing long 4K videos while also gaming, just get the 32 gig version from the start. Last time around, you couldn't even get it configured in 32 gigs, so be glad that we have it now. I have to compare it to the M16. Even in their last generation, they had one SODIMM slot, but in their 2023 version, they've got two SODIMM slots, and they were still able to keep like 90 watt hours of battery, add a third fan, have more heat pipes, the whole lot, and they still have all of that configuration. So so, Legion, you're getting left behind. All right, all right. So let's finally talk about performance. I mostly targeted games which have internal benchmarks so that you guys can compare easily as well. I ran all the games at their QHD plus resolution, at their full resolution scale, ran all of these tests in the performance mode when the ring is red and with dedicated GPU mode on, no overclocking, and also had the device plugged in. All of the games were set to the maximum graphical quality setting. I also refrained from using any frame boosting features like DLSS or frame generation just for better 
comparability and I also didn't use ray tracing in a lot of these game benchmarks as well except where I specified. Let's start off with a very popular benchmarking tool 3 Mark times by. I'm sorry, I'm gonna start looking at my screen now so that I get the numbers right. So at its peak performance with dedicated GPU settings on, I was getting a score of 10,645. And I got a score of around 8,000 in the previous generation, the AMD one. So, I mean, that's a significant leap. Even in the previous Gen 7, Legion 7, the non-slim version, with the 6700M, that went up to 140 watts. I got a score of 10,745. So this is able to compete with last gen's mainstream Legion 7, the non-slim version. So that is identical performance from a laptop that is thinner, lighter and even cheaper that is awesome progress in my books just so that you get a feel for how much performance can drop when you're running this device unplugged so on silent mode with the hybrid setting turned on at its lowest configuration i got a score of 8000 268 that is a decline of 22 percent uh, which actually you think is substantial but it actually isn't usually in my prior experiences you could see a decline of like 50 to 60 percent so what that means is that you can still run your triple a titles on this while on the go however battery life is going to be abysmal like maybe 60 to 70 minutes but if you want more you can go into the nvidia software so their geforce experience software in which you can you know limit the frame rates and other settings to get you more battery life if you want now quick word on the GPU wattage, Legion's literature claims 150 watts of TGP. Naturally that includes dynamic boost as well, which means that 115 watts can only be achieved when the CPU is drawing very little power, which usually in games is not the case. In the real world, what will happen is what you see up on screen. Now this is the average GPU power and the average GPU temps captured while playing a game of World War Z. Uh, in horde mode, the GPU power mostly oscillates between 80 watts and 90 watts. And there are only a few instances, like I think I count four of them, in which the power went above 100 watts. And that is completely normal. And if you take an average of all of these instances, 82 watts was the number. Now when I use these benchmarks, you also compare the 4060 with the 4070 as I had originally uh, planned. So the 4060 and the Slim 7 versus the 4070 that I reviewed in the Legion 7, like the non-slim version, like that Pro 7i. Let's start off with the benchmark within Shadow of the Tomb Raider. I was getting an average frame rate of around 85 on the Slim 7, whereas on the Pro 7i, I was getting 94 frames a second, around a 10% decline in performance. You'd think that's substantial, but it honestly isn't to like the user, to the naked eye. Uh, those additional frames aren't gonna add much to your experience. Moving on to Forza Horizon 5, one of the best racing games out there right now, although it's a little bit dated. Regardless, an average of 89 frames a second on the Slim 7 against 92 frames a second on the Pro 7i. So this was a decline of about 3.3%, negligible, nothing. Moving on to Horizon Zero Dawn, one of my favorite story-driven games ever. I was getting an average of 81 frames a second on the Slim 7 and on the Pro 7i, I was getting an average of 86 frames a second a difference of 5.8 percent again kind of negligible at least in my books far cry 6 i was getting an average frame rate of 73 on the slim 7 and on the pro 7 i, I was getting 82 frames a second so this was one of the larger differences at around 11 percent assassin's creed odyssey i was getting an average frame rate of 62 on the slim 7 and 65 on the pro 7i so that's again a pretty minor difference at about 4.6 percent gears of war microsoft gears of war i mean it's a pretty old game now but still uh, remains to be popular and graphically interesting i got an average of 71 frames a second on the slim 7 and i got an average of 81 frames a second on the pro 7i this is the one of the biggest differences that i found actually onwards to guardians of the galaxy and i got a frame rate of around 90 on average on the slim 7 and on the pro 7 i got an average of 102 about 11 or 12 percent performance decline from the 4070 cyberpunk 2077 still continues to be a very demanding game after years of its uh, release and we can see that in the frame rate i was getting an average frame rate on its maxed out settings 
at 43 frames a second. For a story driven game, 43 I think is fairly adequate. You might have a different sentiment to that. You can tune your settings down to get more frame rate if you want, but for me, like a story driven game, 43 frames a second is perfectly normal. If however you want to use the absolute best settings of Cyberpunk 2077, so that means path tracing on, so that ultimate ray tracing setting with DLSS, DLAA uh, as well you would get 31 frames a second on average on this. Quite a short decline, but it's not like you can't play a game at 31 frames a second if you want. I think the game still looks pretty good and pretty smooth, even at those settings. Rainbow Six Siege still continues to be a very popular multiplayer game. This laptop should give you an average based on its benchmark of 130 frames. You can get very close to 240 frames a second by turning the scale down, turning the LSS on if you want. Also talking about Assassin's Creed Valhalla, I was getting an average frame rate of 65 on the slim 7 and compared to the pro 7i i was getting about 70 frames a second on that again the difference is not all that significant i did get a chance to also test starfield on this device what i've done here is that i'm running this on absolutely maxed out graphics and it seems like it's going to average roughly around 30 frames a second and this is at 1600p 30 frames is still pretty respectable it does sometimes i've seen it dip down to even 20 frames a second if there are too many people in one scene starfield is a very demanding game and i'm glad to see that this device can handle it just fine so now keeping those performance results in mind i want to quickly move to concluding all of my thoughts on the slim 7 the newer jet 8 if i average all of the differences that i found against the 4070 with this 4060 i found about a difference of 10% to me to spend like say the additional $300, $400 to get the version of the Slim 7 with the 4070 does not make a lot of sense because 10% is not going to add a lot to your experience. So I think my first thought is if you're going to get this, get this in the 4060. If you want more brute power, just go with the 4080 then maybe another device. You need to look elsewhere. I think the Slim 7 Gen 8 can still be positioned as a very good all-rounder. It will give you great performance on the go. So in terms of the Slim 7i being the perfect blend of portability and performance, I still think that we can position this as as like an all-rounder if you want to make very little compromises on very little things all across you still don't have to pay an arm and a leg for it it still is relatively light and it's relatively thin and it can still perform quite well when unhooked when you're on the move it can still give you good performance there its thermals are robust not as good as I had originally hoped but still pretty good it still looks good it's still understated there's a few reasons why you want to buy one the thing is when 2023 Three with other manufacturers really upping their features like you have mini LED displays and you've got laptops that are as thin that can rival this device with the same configuration for example like the Z16. Keeping all of that in mind I feel Legion needs to continue to innovate to stay ahead of the game otherwise they can easily get left behind. That being said if you want something that's reliable, portable, high performing and presents good value for money I think this is a great all-rounder still even at the end of 2023. Make sure you get the right specs like with the 32 gigs version. You should get good deals on this as well towards the end of the year. So keep a lookout for that. All right, so that's it for me. Guys, thank you all very much for watching. I hope you did find my content to be useful. And if you did, it'd be great if you could subscribe to my channel. It does offer me quite a bit of encouragement. Until next time, guys. Thank you.